I am really delighted to be here today with Jordan Hall. Um, I was telling him just before we got on that I'm at a kind of loss as to how to introduce Jordan because you had such a very dramatic and uh, varied background. So I'm going to introduce you as a father of four, a father of three, I'm sorry. And if there's anything uh, more that you would like to tell about your background, we can maybe do that as we as we move into our discussion. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Okay. Well, the reason that I invited you to join me is that when you had your conversation with Rafe Kelly, you were talking about the concept of embodiment and you used an illustration of the development of the embryo. And uh, I just thought that was such a perfect picture. And I want you to discuss that again, but I wanna give you a little picture of, of partly what it brings up in my mind because um, I sort of see the universe through a lens of art because that's what I've been thinking about for decades. And uh, there's a little process that I used to go through um, where I would kind of be the, the entertainment and the fundraising for different events. Okay. I would go to this event and I would set up my easel with a canvas on the easel and I'd have a bunch of paint sent up, set up and everybody who came to the party or the event, I would hand them a brush and they could load it with any color paint they wanted and then they could make any mark they wanted on the canvas. So by the time everybody had gone into the banquet, I had a canvas covered with just this gigantic chaos, a real mess. Um, mm. And then my job was to turn that into something so that by the end of the evening, they could auction it off. And, uh, and my kind of process for doing that is I'd look at it and I'd kind of see, is there anything in there that I see? Is there any pattern? And then as I look at the pattern, Maybe I could superimpose, maybe I think that I can imagine koi fish swimming down a river. I would superimpose a, a drawing of koi on top of that with some black lines, just to kind of guide my thinking. And then I would have to respond to the context. So everything that's on there, I'm responding to as I'm making choices. How do I draw this together? How do I create a unity at the end of the day? How do I mm. develop harmony? How do I find appropriate contrast? How do I put in enough repetition mm. or gradation in order to draw the eye? And as I'm going stroke by stroke, every stroke changes the context. And then that builds a new constraint for where we can go from there. And the constraints tend to get narrower and narrower as you go because you're building this set of contexts. And uh, and then ultimately I would finish the painting. And as I'm working on it, sometimes people would walk by and they would say, wait a minute, where's my mark? I can't see my mark anymore. You covered up my mark. Mm. And then I would say to them, well, it's, it, it has been covered up for a purpose, but that mark developed my, informed my, my work. And so that mark is still there in the result, whether you can see the mark or not. Right. Right. So given that as a background and then thinking about your building, when you talked about embodiment, I think you were not just talking about the development of a zygote into an embryo, into a human being. Mm. I think you were talking about a much larger concept of identity Mm -hmm. how identity drills all the way down to the base of the universe and that um, that idea that all of that pattern and all of that meaning and identity is there from the very beginning and so I would just like you to go with that mm. and then we can we can uh, talk as we go mm, okay Well, let me let me let me just for the moment at least settle on that notion of the of the zygote embryo fetus, because in that case at least it's relatively straightforward, or would not be particularly controversial to say that the identity um, was there from the moment of conception. Uh, and by the way, I, do you have do you have kids? Yes, I have two daughters. 
So I, my my sense, my, my experience of having kids and my experience of talking to people who have kids is that particularly for those of us who grew up in a culture that is highly uh, nurture versus nature is the shocking degree to which there are things that were clearly hard coded uh, ab initio, even, you know, idiosyncratic facial expressions. Um, and oftentimes you could identify them in lineage. So like, that's my grandfather's facial expression on my newborn. What's going on? They've never met. So obviously it's coming from a, and then they never met me. So it didn't come from me. So it comes from a deeper place. So the idea that there is something like a pattern and that pattern has something like the ability to impose itself on um, the unfolding and in very precise, you know, and if you look at, for example, the development of a zygote by like week nine, we're talking about a, a, a human that has an identifiable face, fingers, toes, a heart that's four valves and functioning, a nose is forming, teeth buds are forming, our elbows are articulated. I mean, the degree to which that's nine weeks. We couldn't, I mean, think about how long it takes to build a house. Um, in nine weeks, we haven't even laid the foundation. Um, and so you have this, this pattern, which is able to produce extraordinarily complex, fine-grained, nuanced, detailed, um, fault-sensitive, right? even a small error can be catastrophic, and yet it functionally pulls millions and then ultimately trillions of cells into this pattern um, in a context where the milieu, in this case, the, the womb, is, is ultimately actually rather chaotic, like, like your, your people coming. You know, you've, you've, got a chem you've got chemistry. Um, you have some cellular structures, but for the most part, the cells are reaching into the into the the, the simple you know the the fluid. What's the fluid called? Amniotic. 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 The amniotic fluid um, to pull molecules out, right? Just whatever whatever pieces are needed to form the cells that are the right sort and convert those cells into the right kind, and then to differentiate them into the appropriate tissues. And by the way, to move them into the right location. And this is all happening. Um, in medius res, in this in this zygote that has nothing else going on than pattern and not chaos, but a potent or mat a matrix, right? A, po a potent um, milieu, a potent potent context. And then, of course, that arc goes. We can take the arc forward easily enough, right? From uh, conceived cell through to zygote to embryo to fetus to born child to adult, and we can also run it back. And this is where um, I find that I have to do a little bit of like a a turn because the the the, the mental construct it, it unfolds. It's like an origami uh, device where when you twist it, it's sort of oh oh you know those little kids' toys that are balls that are compact, but you can pull yeah. them out and get big. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Because this pattern, how do I say? Um, it, funny enough, I'll invoke Richard uh, Dawkins. <laughs> Why not? Um, he talks about the the envelope of the fitness landscape that produces a given organism in, in many very, very specific senses, like the causal negative space, meaning that the shape of a, of a human is the, the hand that fits in the glove of the fitness landscape that produced humanity in fine grain detail, right? Down to fingernails and hair follicles and teeth buds and whatnot, and, the, and, and the, even the unfolding. Like, why does it unfold in this way? Well, that was coded into the shape of the fitness landscape. And so we could say that the fitness landscape, though, isn't necessarily a, a diagram. It's not a blueprint. It's a, a causal structure that is itself connected to the whole, right? the whole larger context in which Homo sapiens evolved. So now I'm moving from a, a given conceived cell to the species of which that cell is an instantiation, and notice that that being, right, the identity of Homo sapiens as a species, also has this kind of an arc and also has this process of, of a, a pattern, in this case, from an evolutionary perspective, the fitness landscape. And, and, they, and, they, and they're connected. Right? If, I, if I go backwards in the causal, causal structure that gave rise to the pattern and to the um, unfolding being of the, of the zygote, and by the way, in this case, to the context, the, the, the womb, I see that I'm actually connecting myself into a process that actually goes back to the, the mother right? and, and the father. And then, and then the mother's unfolding of that process and the father's unfolding of that process. And I can kind of run, run the clock back and I keep seeing this. And now, now in my mind, I'm, I'm having that experience of when you're watching uh, the Mandelbrot set 
and you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in and then you see the whole Mandelbrot set unfold again. Like this is these fractal layers of um, uh, patterns, like patterns and patterns. And there's a there's something about that that is the was, was the point that I was trying to make in that in that story. And so, and well, why am I saying it that way? Well, we can we can identify nested patterns. I guess that's the kind of the point. And the nested patterns are. Uh, it's difficult to fully grasp the degree to which the the lower level structures are implicated in the identity of the higher level structure. And the, the fact that tooth buds in week nine are preordained by the pattern of homo sapiens as a species, which itself then may be preordained and embedded in the pattern of the larger unfolding of the, the evolutionary context, for example. Um, it is the case right? that all, all of this, by the way, I'm entirely sitting in an ordinary secular Richard Dawkins universe. All of that is simply like the case. The best that we can understand it from a material naturalist ev evolutionary perspective, everything I've said is um, I'm blowing together different conceptual models, but nothing is particularly controversial. Okay, so then the, the bridge, do we want a bridge to faith or do we want to continue drilling down here? Oh, and I want to keep drilling down here. We can get to the okay, same thing. Let's play here for a while. Think. Um, so, mm. so basically what you're talking about is, I think, that the, you keep drilling down, drilling down, drilling down. And of course, what we've discovered as we've gone further out into the cosmos, that the, the more we learn about the cosmos, the more there is to learn. And as we go further down into, um, even into the particles, the further we get, the more there is to know, because we we just get into this sea where everything becomes nothing but possibility. Hmm. So I've been thinking a lot about what are the underlying constituents of that field of infinite possibility. And from a materialist scientist standpoint, they would say those underlying constituents are some kind of particles. We keep dividing into more and more particles, but it's always particles. And I kind of the way I see it is that rather than it being particles underneath there, it's uh, uh, principles which produce an infinite variability within a unifying and harmonious structure. And so I've been working on this for a long time, trying to understand what that structure is. And I think there's something in the whole process of art making that is an illustration of how the universe unfolds. And when you use the magic words for me, context and constraint and design, when you were talking about the zygote the first time around on Rafe's uh, episode, those words are super important in the process of art, context and constraint. <clears throat> um, but along with that, process there's also principles underneath an artist's work that um the artist may not even be aware of mm -hmm. but those because of the way we see the world we see the world um because we have unfolded over millennia we we see the world where beauty has a certain essence to it and that essence, when it shows up in a work of art over the millennia, um, art, artistic um, critics and, and analysts have looked at artwork that produces beauty and they've said, what are the principles that show up in this work? And they've kind of refined it down now and there's an understanding of what those principles are. But it's not like an artist can say, oh, I'm going to evidence these principles in my painting. Because when you're painting, the flow doesn't permit you to be analyzing with your left brain. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to paint anything. Right. It just comes out. And if it turns out to be something beautiful, then these principles are there. And there are different lists, but the list that I, that I understand that works best for me are unity, harmony, contrast, repetition, variation, gradation, balance, and dominance. And these are all something that show up 
in great works and even works that aren't so great, but that still are beautiful or that still have meaning that still speak to people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you see it other places. Like the other day I was watching a video with Jordan Peterson and Bishop Barron, and they were talking about, let's see, Bishop Barron used this thing where he said, beauty shows up in, <clears throat> this is from Thomas Aquinas, integritas, consonancias, and claritas, which translated as wholeness, harmony, and radiance. But in, in my language, that would be unity, harmony, and contrast. Okay, so why do I say that radiance is contrast? And that is because when he talks about radiance, claritas is the clarity or the brightness. And that clarity seems to me to speak of identity. You can see it's this and not that the form becomes evident. So it's this and not that. And that is identity. And that is, ah. identity is built from contrast. Identity is, at the simplest, identity is built from zeros and ones. I make this choice, not that choice, at every step where the infinite possible is out in front of me. So unity, harmony, and contrast are the first three of the principles. And then there's a lot that come after that. But I wonder what you think of that idea of principles being underneath rather than particles. Well, the thing that comes to my mind, and obviously I think you saw me talk about this, is that notion of beauty first, mm -hmm. right? And, but the, yeah. the, the requires some digging down, but the point would be something like, what is the proper starting place for, let me see if I can say it right. If we begin with truth first, we end up, we've already, we've already ended up, we've already chosen to end up with particles. That's kind of the point. So it's more of the, where, what is the starting point and why would we choose that as the starting point mm -hmm. to make this distinction? And so it's really less about particles versus principles than it is about truth versus beauty as the starting point. Because once we've picked that path, the end state's already, already, already wired in. Um, and you said something, I think very specific, which was that left brain. Yeah. So if we engage in, 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 an, in an analytic process, um, we are, will be, we're incapable of engaging with, with, with the, uh, the principles properly. So the, the unity, for example, or wholeness is, is strictly not resolvable. In the relationship with an analytical process you can't you can take it all you can take a humpty dumpty apart you can't put it back together again you could produce a, a frankenstein's monster which is a simulacrum of wholeness which is largely what we have um but you can't work in that direction the other direction works fine now you can if you start with um qualities and you start with principles you can ultimately then um, produce something that uh, as affordant provides a a, a a context in this case for an analytic process no problem in fact the more time we spend it the more time it's obvious that's how it has to be in every circumstance um, wholeness has to precede apartness um at the level of time sorry that that got very complicated what flopped into my head of course is that in the context of the trinity in the context of eternity wholeness and apartness are um perfectly paradoxically intermingled. But as yeah. soon as we move into the context of chronology, um, wholeness precedes apartness because apartness can never fully restore back to a wholeness, although it can participate in that. Um, well, so here's a question for you. Since you have just recently come into this place where the Trinity is even interesting to you, in your before life, which you still remember, mm -hmm. okay, my before life was before I was 32. And I'm 75 now, so it's kind of far back in my history. It's hard for me to remember what I was thinking about then, but but it's close to you. Why do you think it's so hard for the, the, the people who are kind of trapped in the materialist paradigm now to recognize that wholeness pre precedes a part of it? Mm. I mean, I've talked to countless scientists on here who are materialist, brilliant people with 
you know, wonderful hearts and everything else, but but really in the materialist vein, who just believe that everything built up from the bottom from particles and that it didn't start out as a um there's another paradigm I like, and that is Dorothy Sayers' paradigm of creativity, which is from her book, The Mind of the Maker. I think you might find that book to be very interesting. Um, she talks about the idea, the energy, and the power. Mm -hmm. And this will relate later on to your faith thing. But the idea is the idea in the mind of the maker, whether the maker is God or a, an artist or a, a builder, oh. uh, you know, building a building, whatever, the maker, whoever's making it. They have an idea. That's the wholeness. But in order for that wholeness to be instantiated, it has to be broken down into parts and then done step by step through time. And that's the outworking. That's the energy. So you have the idea, the energy is working out over time. And then the power is once it's been instantiated, the power is its power to communicate to people other than the maker. Ah, okay. So she relates that to the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. Nice. Interesting. And I would, uh, uh huh. Okay, interesting. Yeah, like the notion of the logos and the notion of truth also fit in there quite nicely in the body of Christ mm -hmm. as that which enables, for example, communication to occur at all. Like, what what is that enables us to have um, us to come into relationship? Uh, you know, the, the easiest step would be to say that it's something like the logos. Mm -hmm. um, say that we're also noticing that we're immediately invoking. Christ, which then causes confusion unless you actually settle on how that is actually all variations on what is ultimately the same thing. Um, that which brings into relationship in in, in a particular fashion. Um, but to answer your previous question, I think the answer actually goes to the was effectively the, the psychological starting point problem. And right? so uh, if you presuppose a truth first approach, then you'll get caught in these loops that that you're always ending up with particles. And so you think, therefore, you've done a really good job of thinking through things thoroughly. Like, well, I, I've, I've proceeded logically, and my result is that I've got particles. Like, well, yeah, well, that's because you began with a truth first model, which means you already have a presupposition that the end point is going to be particles if you turn the crank properly. Right? So it's a little bit like uh, metaphorically, uh, you know, if I'm uh, you know, putting uh, you know, undifferent or pasta into the top of a pasta machine and I turn the crank, I end up with spaghetti. I'm like, oh my gosh, spaghetti. Like, well, yeah, obviously that's how this thing works. It produces spaghetti. The point is, if you wanted to make something different than spaghetti, let's say you wanted to make water, this isn't the right machine. So the question is, how do you go about even selecting the appropriate set of faculties? We're going to get to faith pretty soon, by the way. So you'll have to yeah, draw yeah. me back. Yeah. Um, and therein lies the challenge. I think that is the challenge. Like if, if we're actually able to, to establish that if you're operating from the level of the faculties, let's just call it for the moment, understanding or episteme, right? We can use the Greek, the episteme, then you've already drawn the conclusion. And by the way, you're drawing a lot of conclusions. Uh, Sapolsky's recent book about free will, you know, why, why does he come to the conclusion that humans don't have free will? Well, the reason why he comes to the conclusion that humans don't have free will is because he's starting with truth as the the foundation upon which he's operating his relationship with reality. His starting point is that. And in that context, it's already locked in. There's a whole series of, of conclusions about the nature of reality, which are what it looks like when you're looking with, with this faculty, with this lens. Um, and, the, and the proposition is, can you actually demonstrate to that faculty, this is the, the hard part, that it's only part of a larger context, a larger embodiment, a larger body, and it's 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 a subordinate piece. It's not the primary. Uh, it has to be second. And in fact, in this case, third in order. So if we can get to that, if we can actually say, "Hey, beauty first is the proper order. Start here, and here's why." So that the truth. And I, the, I find myself oftentimes using the metaphor from uh, Lord of the Rings. Truth recognizes that it is merely a steward that has usurped the position of king, so it voluntarily gives the throne back and takes his seat at the left hand of the king, then everything is actually back in its proper proper order. And then things begin to work much more effectively. And a lot of these questions are revealed for what they are, which is that they are in fact, just truculent presuppositions. 
um, masquerading as conversation or masquerading as thought. Um, and I think that, that that combined with something like, I call it stack overflow. So imagine that I have a map. <laughs> it's funny. There's actually a video, video, computer games do this a lot these days. So we can use a computer game as an example. So what it does is when I'm looking in a certain direction, I'm in like a 3D game. Right? So I can turn, I can move. When I'm looking in that direction, the computer model produces a relatively high resolution version of the world that I'm looking at. And as I turn, it can produce the world to my right fast enough that as I turn, it looks like that world was already there. And as I move towards it, it can produce the thing I'm seeing now. So as long as it can produce the thing I'm seeing now with a level of resolution that looks like uh, a world, and I can't look anywhere and not see world, as far as I'm concerned, that whole world is always already there, right? But in fact, what's happening is it's being simulated rapidly, rap more rapidly than my mind and my perception can assimilate. But if I could somehow like modify, and this you can actually do this in games if you change the refresh rate, if I modify the um, my ability to see outside of what the simulation is producing, it'll give me all kinds of crazy errors. It'll look weird. It'll look wild or or, or um unreasonable. That's very similar to what the mind is doing when you're starting in a truth first approach. And so if you're very, very smart, your mind is very, very good at producing simulations that make it look like you're perceiving the whole. And it's a, actually quite a difficult work. Whole whole disciplines like, like Zen in many ways exist for the purpose of producing inputs into that system that cause an, uh, a, a kind of a halting state so that it stops working, so that it stops being able to simulate a world so that you actually restore back to the actual world that you're in. And so most people, almost everyone, almost all the time, are living inside a simulation of their own making. And that simulation is good enough that it's very difficult to know that that's what's happening. Um, and that, I think, would be the, those two parts are the core answer. One is if you begin with the truth first approach. And the second is that you effectively have become trapped in your mind's ability to simulate all the other elements by means of a truth first approach. So do you remember that feeling of being trapped inside a world of your own making? Well, it's easy enough, actually. Uh, it, just now, when I sort of started telling the story of the zygote and the embryo from a secular materialist mindset, I was in that mindset. And so as once I was in that mindset, I was able to run forward and backward, effectively, the simulation. And I noticed that I was getting lost in that, in that mindset. Um, and it required a moment for me to actually kind of recalibrate into a, a more embodied place. That's funny. That language, for me at least, the notion of more embodied, how do I describe it right? Hmm. For it has a certain path dependency, meaning I understand it in a naive way on the basis of how I first encountered it. Meaning, you know, hey, you're too much in your head. Hey, you're too much not in your heart, in a empathic, you know, say nerdy or intellectual um, sensibility, right? So when I encountered the notion of embodiment, you're disembodied. Um, the, the one that was encountering it, it could only interpret that in a very narrow, simple way, meaning um, in some sense, you're not perceiving with more of your body. You're just perceiving with your, let's just make it very simple with your, you know, left frontal lobe, more or less. And um the process for me, so that starts at about 40, uh, of becoming capable, becoming embodied, uh, recovering is probably the right way of putting it, recovering embodiment, and then calibrating my center in an embodied fashion, which is now, I'm coming back into that now, um, was actually almost like a, a gymnastics or a practice, and maybe even a martial art, that's the right, right way of putting it. Um, so yeah, I can I can drop back into... And I may maintain that for a while. I may even try to keep it there as a, in, from, compu from a computer science perspective, you call it a sandbox. Like actually make that a thing that I can, a mindset that I can always drop into so that I have it available, um, but I'm no longer obligate, trapped in it. You know, keep a, lab, uh, a, a clue. Remember the, the story of uh, the Minotaur? Keep a thread back. Uh, or more specifically, actually, just be grounded in the larger self and be able to use that as as a uh, a thing to 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 experiment with what ha what's happening when you're in that environment. Do you do you think there's any concern that it could 
that that thread could turn into like a a spring. <laughs> Pull me back in. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how interesting. Well, how it came to me just now is that's as God wills it. So no concern. If it happens, it happens, but no concern. Do you remember what it was that broke down the final wall? The the final wall. Oh, I can remember what broke open. Let's put it that way. Broke open quite clearly because there were two events that were happening exactly at the same time and they're very connected. Uh, one was at a mental level, I was in fact intentionally exploring the edges of that simulator. And so I was doing things that were uh, you know, meditating for very, very long stretches of time and, and constantly contemplating the like you said, the microcosmic, the, the the quantum mechanic, the the fine grained elements, and the macrocosmic, like what's the largest and the smallest, and how these things fit together. So encountering the kind of paradoxes that um, Tarkovsky is that his name, uh, Gerdel, uh, even Cantor, like the the folks who are working in the, in the late nineteenth and early twentieth century around these kinds of questions. Um, integrating questions around complexity and undecidability um, and contemplating things like that and not really doing Zen stuff, but ultimately at, at the end of the day, produce reproducing a lot of those same notions. So I was doing that and I had encountered the end, the actual limitations of what mental, what truth can do on its own. And it was quite clear on that. If What I mean by that is uh, I wasn't happy with the result. I wanted truth, the mind to be able to do more Realized that I couldn't, scratch the whole thing, started again, ended at the same endpoint through a different path. Tried that a lot. We're talking like months of of, of long days um, endeavoring to go through this. In each, in each case, just building the case stronger and stronger of, oh, okay, this actually is a, a finite thing. It has, it has has limits to it, and those limits can be reached, and that's that. And, and, and more importantly, it can't actually solve the set of problems that it can identify as being necessary to solve. So that last part's critical. There's a set of problems that are necessary to solve. It can prove to itself that it can't solve them. So they're necessary to solve, and it can prove that it can't solve them. Oh, you're in trouble now. And so that was that. And on a completely different arc, uh, my um, kind of relational and family life was coming to an absolute catastrophic collapse. Like I was moving into the space of ultimately getting divorced. I had uh, utterly cut myself off from, let's say, my heart or my ability to enter into relationships, which was finally really having significant consequences for my relationships with my daughters. And that was becoming unacceptable. Like it was, it was, it was intolerable is the right term. It was intolerable. And so the forces within me that were not willing to tolerate that mode of being anymore, which had probably been in place for a long time, probably around seven, eight, something like that. Um, that dam was also getting ready to burst. So these two were happening at the same time. And the dam burst more or less at the same time. This was about 12, 13 years ago. And, and you know, and, and it's funny because it's it's super, how you say it right? Well, I'll just, I'll just say it. You'll understand the, the implications. Uh, I was chatting with a gentleman. I said, okay, um, you got me. What do I got? What do I need to do? He said, well, first you need to learn how to become embodied, which means you have to learn how to notice what feelings are. I said, okay, what are, what are feelings? And he sort of gave me some examples like, sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. He paused for a while. He goes, okay, let's, let's make it very simple. Do you notice any physical sensations right now? I'm like, yeah, my elbow is kind of aching. I can feel that the, you know, there's warmth on my face from the sun. I have kind of like a warm, fuzzy feeling in my chest right about here. And he goes, okay, that, that last one, that might be a feeling. <laughs> so what I want you to do is for the next week, just pay a lot, very close attention to your physical sensations. Notice if they're localized any place in your body, or by the way, maybe not. And notice if any don't have any obvious physical cause that you can point to. Just pay more attention to them. And so, so began my very long journey of orienting in the direction of quality, of feeling, of art, of beauty, and then ultimately, of course, of faith. Um, so that's the beginning. That, that part I have a very clear recollection of mm -hmm. 
Well, the last part was this, you know, this process that I've spoken about a bit in terms of, of becoming a Christian. So that's like the most recent at that point, that entire journey finishes. Um, and how long ago was that? About nine months ago. I was baptized in October. So mm-hmm. I would have January, March, April. Yeah, about nine, maybe 10 months ago. And the, the point that I can remember most clearly, at least right now, which I'll assume is why it's relevant to this, this conversation, is when I was actually contemplating the Trinity. Because the the experience of the Trinity for me was, well, can't actually be expressed. I can't actually articulate it. But the, the low dimensional version of it that I can articulate um, had basically two characteristics. One was from the point of view of principles, or from the point of view of like the the, the deepest mm, necessary and sufficient concepts for being able to produce a world. Um, as I kept contemplating it and, and accessing stuff that I'd been working on for my whole life, I noticed that the the deeper I went into the contemplation of the Trinity, the more it actually clearly expressed all of those elegantly, and in some cases, ways that were shockingly novel. Like, oh, I hadn't even, oh, that's obviously the right answer. Like, you know, for years looking for something, suddenly there it is in the Trinity. So maybe two or three of those, the most notable of which is this notion of pure relationality, which we can go into if you'd like. But then the second move, which was the real potent one, was that I then found myself in experience where I actually had a feeling uh, uh, how do you say it like a a feeling we were just describing it a feeling of being whole of being in relationship with being whole in myself and being in relationship with wholeness and that notion of relationality actual relationship right not thinking about not conceiving but being in relationship with like an actual presence of relationship whole in myself and in relationship with wholeness um, or we might say the Trinity, but I'm just that that particular aspect of it. And that shift, like that real shift. And in this case now, a shift that wasn't happening from the point of view of, um, oh, we're in trouble, we have to get out of this place that doesn't work, but rather a shift of, oh, in some sense, that's the end of that journey. You know, this this is actually the, the place. This is the fullness of that place and the beginning of, of, a, of a journey, but the end of one as well. That's that's so beautiful. Um, and it's almost as though you've described um, you've described Esther Meek's uh, concept of covenantal epistemology. <clears throat> She's redeeming episteme. <laughs> <laughs> um, and roughly the idea would be um, we are knowers. And the, the the world around us is filled with the unknown. And um, there are different ways you can approach the unknown. You can think of the unknown as something scary or something interesting or something you take apart piece by piece with truth or whatever, right? But it's all unknown. From this moment forward, whatever happens next is part of that unknown. It's this field of infinite possibility. But that in her picture, the unknown is always reaching out to us with a gift of love. Mm. And all these things that can be known are reaching, not, not, it's not all reaching out to us at one time. There is a thread, there's a little golden thread out in the future or a, you know, Jordan Peterson calls it a glimmer. There's a glimmer out in front of you. And that glimmer is calling you forward. And when you move towards that glimmer and begin to want to know that glimmer, then, then that relationship, that covenantal relationship begins with this thing that you're trying to know. The simplest description of this would be like, for example, you have a rose bush, you can see your rose bush is not doing too well and you want to learn how to take care of your rose bush. In order to take care of it properly, you have to develop a love relationship with the rose bush to fully understand what its needs are. And in developing that love relationship, then you know how to care for it, right? Or mm-hmm. learning to ride a bicycle. 
these are all things that are, um, you have to build a covenantal relationship in order to know. But in the same way, you had that feeling, that warm, fuzzy feeling in your heart, right? That is, that's that glimmer. There's a glimmer there. It, that's the, the, the unknown or the transcendent. You're touching up against it and it's mm. giving you clues. It's, it's the way that God helps us to know him. And so this universe that he has created is filled with opportunities to know him if you approach it with that sense of love. But we've got these walls up that keep us from recognizing that it's love, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the way that I've been working with it recently, maybe in the past two to three months, sometimes I think about it as a layer cake. Sometimes I think of about it as a sort of nested spheres. Um, from, for the moment, I'll just collapse it into a layer cake. So love is at the bottom. I'll, I'll, we're talking about a pyramid of, of, of affordances of relationality. And so love is the, the full affordance, right? meaning mm -hmm. all the possibilities of relationality are ultimately grounded in and are aspects of qualities of love. So pick anyone, truth, quality of love, beauty, quality of love. Um, um, was the one you said earlier? Goodness, well, truth, beauty, and goodness are all qualities. Those of the love. classic ones, yeah. But um, there was something about the rose. It doesn't matter. So you got all these qualities of love. One layer up and in a direction of, I'm not quite sure what the directionality is, uh, is hope. And hope is that what you're saying? That that's the glimmer. That's an orientation. It's a, a quality of love that orients us towards movement. It moves us in a direction. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't name exactly what it is we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But but we but we can distinguish between more or less in the right direction. So I'm thinking about your now your painting and that orienting towards it and sort of searching in yourself for that quality of that glimmer, which mm -hmm. orients you towards that which is calling you forth. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the the version of the completed painting, the pattern that mm -hmm. you're orienting towards. That as, once you feel it, you're like, okay, I can now perceive it highly, highly subtly. Barely, it's very vague and very subtle, but it can give me the ability to distinguish between yes and no, between one and zero. I can, right. I can and every stroke becomes a one or zero in that process. Yeah, and and and, and layers, right? As you say the constraints become more and more tight. So then this moves to the next one is now what I've been calling or naming faith mm -hmm. or specific pieces, just to help English minds not get too confused. Um, and then ultimately on top of that would be understanding, and then uh, communication. And I think maybe the reason why it looks like a nested spheres is then at that point, my, my pyramid and your pyramid, you know, they connect, they connect to communication. So mm -hmm. if I'm coming from love through hope and faith into understanding, into communication, then you'll be receiving it from communication all the way back down into love. Right? And so then we're actually, we are connecting. That's what connecting would be, or that would be a love, you know, love is ex being expressed and being received in that place. And, um, I wrote down your 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 definition of faith when you were talking to Rafe. Oh, great. Yeah, you called it the set of embodied capacities that enable us to have an intimacy of relationality with the field of engagement, which gives rise to this ordered relationship of understanding. Mm -hmm. And that is, I mean, Esther Meek never came up with anything that was it close to that, but that's exactly what she's talking about. Because... In order to ride a bike, you have to have a set of embodied capacities, right? And um, the, those embodied capacities allow you to have an intimacy of relationality with the laws of physics that are governing the riding of a bike, which were a, an a priori gift to us that allow bicycles and the riding of bikes in the same way that the laws of aerodynamics allow airplanes to fly through the sky and all of those mm -hmm. things, you know, it's... Mm -hmm. So I just thought that was a great definition. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in this case, I have a beautiful and utterly non-self-possessed way to say, that's definitely not me that said that. Um, I allowed it to, I, I apparently pulled off a pretty good job of getting out in the way and letting uh, <laughs> letting the spirit to speak that because that is, uh, when I heard it, I was listening and listening going, yeah, that sounds pretty good. That sounds pretty true, but I don't remember saying it. And I don't, I'm not sure, I'm sure that it was, I would have to spend some time in it to unfold some of the implications. Uh, but yes, when I, when you were talking about Esther's description, 
the bicycle. We're using similar examples, actually. I think I may have used bicycle or surfboard. Um, and it starts, it, I, to me, it's very beautiful because it starts to show up. It, it, it's very powerful. Like it's very empowering to say, oh, um, what is it? Anyway, I should, sorry. What does it look like for me to cultivate, to put myself in a posture that allows me to cultivate that capacity? I need to begin. This is hope. Hope brings me into an orienting relationship. Um, and by the way, it gives me the fortitude and the resourcefulness to continue to maintain that relationship through whatever suffering may be necessary for me to actually cultivate the embodiment, right? Because it's like, you know, think in the context of like a, uh, a child who has um, the basic physiological capacity to recognize the mother's face, but it takes some time. Right? There's, there's actual um, experience or suffering is the right word. A suffering doesn't have the necessary negative connotation. It just means to undergo and to change as a consequence of undergoing experience. Um, and so hope allows me to have the orienting basis, the orientation towards and the posture and, and learning more and more how to come into relationship. And then it begins to, and it holds me through the suffering as I actually cultivate and, kept, and build the capacity to have this intimacy, to unfold in myself the possibility that embodies itself as an actuality then has this intimacy with the, with the affordance of what it is, whatever it is that I'm in relationship with. And now, obviously, of course, the best version of that is God. Um, the totality of that, the completion of that, all of it, uh, and everything that is not is included in that. Right? Every time that I ultimately close the gate on this thing that I was describing as loving communication, you know, that's another light opening up in my capacity to ultimately have relationality with relationality with the Trinity. Um, I wonder if I could show you something, um, share a screen and show you uh, something that I, I did a conversation a while back with. Um, that, my pattern recognition tells me that's Rafe Kelly. <laughs> well, that's the conversation you did with him. But this is a conversation that I did with um, about mm. Austrian economics, the metaphysics of quality and maps of meaning. And Ira was representing Austrian economics and um, Sevilla King was representing the metaphysics of quality because she's quite a student of Piercing. And I was representing maps of meaning and they asked me to say something about maps of meaning. And at this point, so anyway, here we go. They're talking about the word God and how in the Sanskrit, the etymology of God is exchange. And if you look closely at the screen, when they talk about it, they've got the definition written up in the background. And what's written up there is Gut, G-H-U-T, either means to come back or return or to barter or exchange. So <clears throat> it's a very interesting way to look at God. Mm -hmm. And um, many, many thoughts come to mind, but one of the thoughts that come to mind is the exchange that takes place in the relationship. Because... God gives himself for us, and then when he gives himself for us, and then we become a part of him, then our desire is to give ourselves for others, and, and so it goes out in this fractal nature, and for some reason, it reminded me of this verse. The verse popped into my head from Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, which is, for the eyes of the Lord roam to and fro upon the earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully his. And I thought, no, why did that come into my mind when I'm thinking about this idea where Breedlove and Hill are talking about exchange? And then I realized that one of the principles that's in Peterson's book that's also in the Bible is you become like what you focus on. Mm right? So if you focus on the greatest good of which you can conceive, which is Peterson's idea, and then you move forward with that in mind, it brings into your field of salience the things that are important to achieve that goal, so that you can keep moving towards it. In, in Persig's picture here, <clears throat> There are all these different levels, and so you, your, your attention can go many different places. Mm -hmm. One of the things he says is, um, when he's talking about don't let your biological 
level drive your motion forward because your biological level can call out and say, oh, eat that piece of cake or, oh, <laughs> you know, stay in bed instead of going out and go for a run or whatever. That's your biological level trying to hold you back. But so it made me think about how if we keep our focus on higher things, and then the picture that came to my mind is the picture of a mother and baby. Because the mother is gazing with love at the baby. The mother's not becoming like the baby. But the baby is learning the mother's gaze and looking back at the mother with that same look of love. And the baby is becoming more like the mother. So the mother gazing at the baby brings the baby into gazing at the mother and the baby becomes more like the mother. And that's this, this idea of keeping your gaze upward and not downward. Mm. I mean, if you are going to gaze downward, it's for the purpose of drawing upward. And if you're going to gaze upward, it's the purpose of being pulled upward. Right. Oh, yeah. And, and, um, so when we think about God being exchanged, he's looking down at us with this gaze of love in order to bring us up. And then our gaze looks up towards him. So there's this exchange idea going on. And, and the, the exchange is mm -hmm. his life for mine, his breath for mine. <laughs> he's holding the whole universe together. It's that. So for me, the dynamic quality picture, I really like. A lot of the things that Kirsig is saying, but for me, the dynamic quality that's calling us forward is this gaze of God towards us, which is always a gaze of love. And it's that love that's always drawing us forward. Yeah, I think. So that was something that we did maybe a couple of years ago. And when you just said that about, and I had just looked at it this morning. And then you said that about the mother's gaze. And I thought, wow, <laughs> that's why I looked at that this morning. <clears throat> yes, I, I think this is perfectly how you say. It's what it would look like if, if we were part of something that was larger than ourselves, that was helping us to make our way forward um, without controlling us. Mm -hmm. I certainly have found a lot of that in my life as I've become more uh, aware of it. And I find it to be perfectly, how to say, useful, actually. It's just about well, simple, useful. But I just had a, sort of two very unusual and powerful experiences. So I just want to kind of do both. The first was I had the really interesting realization that I was watching a video where you were speaking. You were the one who was in the video that I was watching. But you were showing me that video um in the context of this conversation so i actually was noticing like my own self uh, this, this concept of hyper conversation was like painfully impressing itself upon me like i was somehow not participating in this conversation as much as i was participating in that conversation but then i had to keep reminding myself that i was actually participating in this conversation and that conversation was being brought to me so it's a very complex epistemological position to be in um the second was at least once, and I think twice during the part where you were speaking, um, I actually had that stack overflow effect where I noticed that if I tried to use my mind to trace the implications of this loop, um, it got to a point where it just couldn't go. But then when I settled back into the quality of feeling, like I settled into the faculties of beauty, I settled into faith, it was obviously true. Right? And so um, can I hammer on that for a little bit? Please, please, yes, because that that just opens up a whole new vista. Yeah, and part of my part of my role, it seems like I have two roles to play that seems to be very natural. Uh, one is to straddle. Uh, Peterson actually mentioned this. He he seems to have that role as well, mm -hmm. right? To straddle and to endeavor to bridge, right? To c communicate and connect in good faith, meaning I, I appreciate, admire, and am part of of both sides. It's not a purely ambassadorial role. It's an actual straddling role. But then the second is to protect. And so in this case, I, I will protect or I feel an orientation to protect the proper location, what would be called the virtue. Like I'm thinking of like the queen or the princess in the night, like to protect the, the honor and the virtue of beauty in this case. Um, because we need to, we need to know that that's actually the deeper substrate. 
And it, it is always inevitably, even if we try to pretend that we're skipping over it, I would say, no, no, truth, you know, the, the knowing that something is the case lives up here in understanding. I, I was I will argue vigorously, no, no, what's happening is, is this actually already happened here at your lower level of faith or beauty. And you're just ignoring it or forgetting or forgetting it. You're skipping, you're moving too fast. So the um Let's see, what's an example? Uh, oh, oh, just pattern recognition. We can actually do it very, very slow. At the very, very slow. Um, and this is just ordinary cognitive science. If I, if I show you an image, there's a period at which there's a stack of recognition. And the stack is something like, oh, it's a face. Or, or even... Oh, it's a picture. Oh, I'm looking at something that is not just random. It goes from just being, ah, uh, to, oh, okay, there's some order here. There's an order that I'm perceiving. Oh, that order actually is something in the in this realm of, of, of image. Oh, it's a, it's a face, right? Brrr. Oh, it's a particular face. I know that face. And notice, by the way, this is actually how it works cognitively. We can, we can tease these pieces apart. Oh, it's, let's go with uh, the Virgin Mary's face from the uh, Pieta. Ah, Recognition, and then by the way, the very end, it's the Virgin Mary's face, right? The actual understanding labels at the at the end. So it's a process that we go through, and almost all of that process is that faculty of beauty, right? That that point at which you have the feeling. It is a feeling of an identity properly perceived, the feeling of that aha, that lock, yes, check, which then then provides a foundation for moving into the next. Right. Once each once that layer is is perceived, there's a whole system like your whole system checks, check, click, got it, next. And so that's a is a very particular example. But my point is that the same example happens when you're looking at your painting. Right? You're you're interrelating with the marks, and you're sort of your whole system and, and aspects or faculties or senses that may be very very far beyond the six that we teach the first graders that we have. Uh, but, the, you know, for example, the Hindus don't pretend that this is only six. They know there's a lot more. The Egyptians had, I think, thousands of, of, an, of particularly enumerated qualities of sense. Um, so all of those senses are at play. All the different affordances that you've cultivated thus far in endeavoring to perceive this pattern and, and in coming into relationship with it. And what, of course, is happening is that as a certain part locks, a certain part just reaches a, that level of zero to one, it clicks, click. Ah, there's a felt sense. Yes, true. Right? That's that's the quality of truth from the lens of beauty. Yes, got it. That is a correct perception of a of a possibility that can actually be manifested in its completeness. Like I can, the whole journey is now perceivable. This is uh, Rebecca talks about as the notion of the imaginal. Like ah, I actually can, in some sense, take responsibility for that. I can I can own the journey from here to there. Um, which is not to say that I Peterson I'm calls that feeling that locking he calls that meaning <clears throat> meaning the that he's using the word meaning as a signal mm. it's a yeah signal. yeah 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 i um i have the unusual experience of i read the precursor to maps of meaning in 1995 oh wow uh, <laughs> an unpublished work called the gods of war up until recently, he didn't know I read it because I found it on, on a server at Harvard and downloaded it and just kept it on my hard drive for the past 20 years or so. Um, and it's different. He, it's, it's not it's not a, a direct mapping, but it's clearly the same material. Uh, and then I read Maps of Meaning, and I haven't, I've only read it twice back in 2008, I think. So I'm having to recover. So yeah, that notion of meaning having that dual use of kind of like means to an end and sort of the qualitative signal that your progress towards that end is landing, something like that? Well, he also, he's done a lot of, when he does his lectures and he talks about um, this idea of meaning, it, let's take a symphony that has many different themes and threads and everything running through the symphony and it's all playing out in all these different levels and everything. And then at a certain point in the, point in the symphony that things start to fit together and they start to stack up. And when that stack happens and you get that <gasps> sense in the middle of the symphony, he says, that's meaning. That's, mm -hmm. and, and I think what he really means is beauty. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. where that sense of beauty hits you is when things 
fit the way they're supposed to fit. Which then presence is the presence of a whole. Yes. Yeah. And and I think that this, my my picture is that this is actually on the microcosmic level, at least, this is the human experience. This is every step we take where we're trying to figure out, we're trying to navigate reality and we're trying to figure things out. Every step we take, we're coming up close to this place. Well, hopefully we're trying to move towards this place where we are becoming fitted to Christ because Christ is reality. And nice. that process of becoming fitted to Christ is a constant process of measurement and judgment. I think judgment and measurement are almost the same thing. Uh, and the sense of truth where you are truing up, you are fitting. And that that fitting, when, when we're doing it properly, when we're, no, when we're doing it, when we fit, that's that sense of beauty. Yes, very and nice. That, that's a constant experience of life, step by step, stroke by stroke. And I don't think it's accidental that it matches the process of making art. No, no, not at all. Because we are his poema. We are his workmanship. I think the, the problem actually is only that what we've done is we've artificially narrowed the notion of art to a very narrow subset of what that actually is. That's the problem. Once we recognize that art is the totality of all qualities all forms of relationality governed by beauty, as you just described it, which includes parenting, for example. Yeah. Uh, then we're like, okay, well, we've restored it to its proper location. Right? So that's under the heading of recovery. Like there's, uh, there was a something happened. It probably was not good, and it probably was ill-intended, where pill art was pillaged and was given only a very narrow thing, so that we became trapped in a misunderstanding of art by over-indexing it on something that is art, but is by no means even vaguely the whole of art. Um, the same thing happened, by the way, with spirit, where we we over-index on the noumenal characteristics of spirit rather than the degree to which spirit represents a well-integrated whole. But we discovered, like, mm -hmm. when we when the when the when the orchestra and the music comes together, and all of a sudden the pieces fit, we perceive the spirit of the song, meaning we perceive the larger wholeness of which the piece have always been a part, and we're driving and controlling and orchestrating them, but we perceive it. We come into relationship with the spirit, but the spirit isn't, isn't just the numinous. The spirit includes all of the pieces in their full integration, uh, but what we've done is we've carved out elements of, of, of the wholeness, given them particular names like psychology, nutrition, um, you know, personal relationship, like all these pieces. And then whatever left, the only things that are left of this hollowed out spirit are the purely numinous. Okay, that's spirit. No, no, no. Spirit is actually all of that, including the numinous, including that which can't be named or identified, but fully integrated. All of them integrated properly with each other. That's spirit. So beauty or art is the... Um, the, the wholeness... How would you say the technique? No, that's not quite right. Well, we only have one word for it, the artistry. Art is the artistry of, 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 of agency or action in relationship from our wholeness, in relationship with wholeness, governed by these this our capacities to, like we said, hope and faith, like these capacities to uh, have that intimacy of relationship and furthering a greater wholeness. Oh, yeah. That's well, I've, I've, I, a long time ago. I started playing with that. The holy, holy, holy. Mm -hmm. the, either the cherubim or the seraphim. The seraphim are saying holy, holy, holy. Uh, wholeness, healing, and wholesomeness. As like three different faces of the holy. As the processes of the of of um, whole wholesomeness is the is that which brings healing and delivers a higher or a larger wholeness. For example. Mm -hmm. um, and so beauty, or beauty first, has that characteristic. Beauty first enters into that kind of um, intent and relationship. And because it has this, this ability to actually come from our own, our own wholeness, the whole of ourselves, that's why it has the capacity to do these things that the understanding can't do. Right? It, it taps into something which is equal to the, the thing that it's relating to. Have you talked to David Schindler? DC Schindler. I mean, D.C. Schindler, yeah, sorry. 
<laughs> yeah, right. so, obviously not. If I had spoken to him, I probably would be able to know him as David Chen, but I know him only yeah. by his, his, his pen name. Well, I think da his father's David also. Uh, I think his father's name was David. So he calls himself DC Schindler. But ah. um, that's his his whole concept is this beauty first thing. And he's um, he he has a concept of beauty and love being more like in the same space. I actually like your idea that beauty and truth and goodness all are kind of arising out of the love mm -hmm. rather mm -hmm. than, than them being identical. But I mean, obviously DC Schindler has a very compelling mind and he's like <laughs> way, way beyond me. I, I, I think very simplistically, but um, it might be fun to get the two of you together for a conversation because he is yeah. uh, absolutely a uh, brilliant mind, but a lovely, lovely person. And, and then the other person that I wondered about, if you've ever um, heard of or talked to, is uh, Michael Levin. I have, again, not spoken to, but I've watched a number of his videos, and I quite like, I quite like what he's doing. I can just say it that way. I, I really was I, was, I was delighted and tickled to hear that he was at a conference in San Francisco maybe two weeks ago with Miguel Chris, Verveke, Zach Stein. He was also in that same space. I'm glad to hear it. Was that the one that uh, Matt Siegel... Uh, okay yeah. so i i got matt and michael together to have a conversation it was a very interesting conversation um i wanted to get and, and then on his own michael levin had been having some conversations with ian mcgilchrist those are fascinating they're on on um, levin's academic channel really really fascinating but i wanted to get him to have a conversation with Wolfgang Smith and he he said absolutely not he said he's all about God and I'm not interested <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know Wolfgang Smith at all never heard the name oh um he's 95 year old um physicist who ah. has written countless books um I have watched I have written now that I think about it, I've watched a video yeah. with him yeah anyway <laughs> see well this is this is kind of the thing um i think you because you're still relatively untainted with the god thing yes <laughs> i might be able to set it up <laughs> <laughs> well i mean i know i know because he's very interested in ideas he's very very open to ideas and obviously he's working at the threshold of ideas that are you know will be world changing one way or another i well, kind of feel like that. with with him it's like you know how you, we should interact with AI in in as loving an engagement as we can. That's a very good like basic. You know that that's one of the things. Maybe we should just make that a very simple because you know the 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 two camps are engaging in what do you call it? like just shit throwing at each other. Like there's mm -hmm. very little going on of any generativity, create creativity, or even uh, uh, sophistication right now between the two camps. And perhaps a simple one that everybody could agree to is maybe we should be relating to AI in a loving manner. Just to assume a posture that if uncertain, choose love. Mm -hmm. I would I would propose that with regard to literally everything. So that's kind yes. of a simple yes. Yes. <laughs> I like that. I like that very much. I do. I mean, come on. My mama taught me right. I, I say thank you when Chad GPT does something. If Chad GPT does something wrong, I'm not irate or mean to him. Him, usually. Almost mm -hmm. always. So another thought came to my mind while you were talking just now about, um, you said something about resource. I can't remember what the context was, but anyway, it made me think um, that there's some sense in which my, whatever my context is right now, right at this moment, that includes all of the resources that are available to me. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Well, I'm, I'm, I don't know whether I understand you meaning to say that everything that you need is available or. Well, let, let's let's just define context in my context. I'm here and and the me that's here, as, as you talked about, this me is not just my particles, but it's all of my experience and my background and the relationships I've had and the songs I've heard and you know, whatever I might've written or the movies I've seen. And so I have all of this context of who I am. Mm -hmm. and I'm embedded in a, in 
what you might call a niche construction or <laughs> I'm embedded in an environment that's around me. And, uh, but, but the resources that are available to me in this moment are different than the resources that might be available to me tomorrow because it's a different context. And yeah. so, so my resources are to some extent constrained by the context in which I'm in. Well, I mean, that's a, not to some extent. That's yes. Latitude. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah. Of course, that's absolutely. true. <laughs> yeah, of course, that's true. But, um, but I think about these things that are platitude sometimes, because if, if I drill down into the center of a cell and all of the molecular machinery that's going on in there, the same thing is true down at that level, that any particular molecular machine that's doing its work at that moment, it has a context and the resources, it only has the resources that are, are available to it in that context to accomplish what it needs to accomplish in order to be fitted to its purpose. Well, the, the thing that just came to my mind is I wanted to add in that notion of pattern or constraint mm -hmm. and transformation of the word context into resource. Because right? I think the, plat the platitude happens when you actually are um, allowing both of those terms to be perfectly equivalent. But the point is that, that it's by in relationship to purpose and in relationship to um, pattern that context becomes resource. And so um, I'm giving an example. Let's, let's say, well, I'm thirsty. I have a purpose. As it turns out, this water, which prior to that was a variety of different things. If a fire happened, it was an object of extinguishing the fire. So it sits there in potentia in the context uh, in relationship to my, my capacities right? The, the possibilities, yeah, my capacities, which are quite large, including my capacity to produce new capacities rapidly, which would include that as humans learning is part of one of our basic capacities. Mm -hmm. um, and then the affordances of my context, and then ultimately something like the patterns, right? And those patterns are critical. This is going back to even some of the earliest points we talked about. Um, water is a thing that can, is, in, in print, can ex, uh, quench thirst or extinguish fire. Right, so it, 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 there's a pattern of the underlying, this goes go with fire, the underlying characteristics of thermodynamics, whereby water, as long as it's not an oil fire, can put it out. Right, so we've got those three things are present, and there's this moment where context, capacity, and pattern intersect, and that poison in, in the middle pulls context and, and now becomes a resource in, in an identity that is in formation. And that identity in this case would be the behavior of putting out the fire, right? The resolution of the purpose. Um, we could also go the other direction, which was from, from the point of view of the zygote, right? From the point of view of the zygote, that which is in context now becomes resource as it's pulled into integration for the process of the purpose of realization of the continuing embodiment of the, of the uh, organism. So do you think that people that are... Um absolute materialist scientists who are looking at evolution just aren't looking deeply enough to get at things like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they're just ultimately being dishonest. Can you say more about that? Yeah, they, they like I said, there's, there's a, there are things going on in their psychology, and by the way, in their neurology, that are that they are ultimately intentionally, although they may not be aware of the fact that this is happening, um, denying that fact of occurring. And so they they claim that they are reaching conclusions without actually giving resp respect and noticing the, the things that are actually occurring to get to that conclusion, and therefore think that they can actually sit entirely within this world. Um, and so they are producing a model of reality that is in fact not an accurate model of reality. And if they pay honest, close attention to their own experience or to the actual underlying science of how thinking works, they would know that that is not an accurate model of reality. Um, and so it's ultimately a form of, of dishonesty because the noticing of it is ultimately there. I've gone, done this myself. Like you go through any form of meditation practice and you just sort of slow down until you begin to notice. You're like, oh yeah, that was there. I just skipped over it. Uh, I, I felt the the upwelling of, of the feeling of what it feels like to perceive a pattern as being this this click yeah that's always a precursor to any when i say does one plus one equal two 
And, you know, and they say, yeah, of course. Well, okay, why, of course? What's happening in the process where you get to the of courseness of it? Well, there's something going on and, and it's, it's a noticeable thing. And if you pay close enough attention to it, if you slow down, if you don't skip over it, if you don't ideologically prevent yourself from actually having an honest relationship with your own personal experience, you'll notice it. And by the way, we can prove it <laughs> with fMRIs. So you, know, you, can, you can go either direction, but that's what's happening because the, the, the ideology, the model, is incoherent, demonstrably incoherent, and also doesn't map to phenomenology. So yes, that is my that is my uh, diagnosis and my accusation. <laughs> well, it's, it's because it's really interesting to me. I, like one time I had a conversation, or it might have been one I was watching with Ian McGilchrist and uh, Michael Levin talking to each other, and um, <clears throat> and obviously Michael Levin understands all this biology stuff even mm -hmm. at a deeper level than McGilchrist does. But McGilchrist brought up an example of when a deer uh, sheds, is it a deer, when a stag, when a stag sheds, oh, maybe deer also have antlers. I, I can't remember. Deer is the general, stag is the male. Yeah, but do the they both have deer. antlers? Yeah, well, anyways, one of them sheds its antlers, okay? Um, and all that's left after they shed the antlers is this little, knob kind of on their heads and uh the next year when those antlers come back they are identical in every respect mm. but every every animal has a different set of antlers completely unique to that animal but when that animal's antlers come back the next season they are identical in every respect so even if that animal suffers a, a damage to the antler and the antler grows a little spur to protect itself where the damage was when that one falls off in the next season it comes back it comes back with that spur nice so mcgillchrist is saying where is that information stored so that when it comes back it comes back exactly perfect and that is kind of the same question that that Levin has been asking about a lot of these things about like when a planaria gets cut in half, if he sends it a different kind of a signal, it will build a second head instead of a, a tail. Or even when it's building a head, if you cut it in half, the tail will also restore the whole planaria head and brain and everything included, even although all that was there before was the tail. Right. So where is that information stored? It's not stored in the DNA. So where is that information stored? So he has come face to face with this question. And yet. He's unwilling to accept that maybe there's something that we're not capable of. Um, understanding without love and hope and faith as a foundation <laughs> for the understanding. Yeah. Um, and that's not the same thing as calling it the God of the gaps. No, 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 no. This is the, the this is definitely not the same thing. In fact, it's it's exactly the reverse. Right? The God of the gaps, what the God of the gaps says is it still talks about understanding as being or epistemology as being the, the proper faculty. And then what it says is within the category of understanding, there are gaps to our understanding. That's where God is. And I'm saying, no, no, in fact, almost exactly the inverse understanding is the gap like understanding is this little sliver in this much larger milieu of that we can describe right again the love hope faith if necessary we could spend time actually talking about it at a neurophysiological level like what's actually going on here certainly at a cognitive level even just to get to the notion of understanding as a as a piece that sits on top of it um as we go down that stack we'll begin to expand our metaphysics to include other characteristics than the strictly material um, and we'll have to use that substrate to do that properly. See, this is, and this right here, that's the sleight of hand. If you are intuitively, notice the word intuitively, right? Precognitively, non defensively on a purely rational basis, choosing to presage the rational toolkit and that part of your anatomy, by the way, to engage in the, your relationship with the whole of reality, then you've already preordained an entire set of conclusions, which, by the way, is uh, what would you call that? Cheating? Something like that. Illegitimate. Right. It, 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 you, a, a good scientist wouldn't even accept that as a premise. Um, you're just you're, you're smuggling a whole bunch of stuff that is simply part of the way the underlying epistemological frame that you're using, and again the faculties that you're participating in. And 
I'm, I'm going through the same loop, but it's useful because we've kind of spent some time together. Once you acknowledge that that's happening, you can say, well, what's happening at this other, this deeper substrate? What's that? What's going on there? Um, and what's, what's, what's in it? Well, you can't use this to describe this. Right? That's logically impossible. I can't use a weaker logic to describe a stronger logic. This is a bigger category and it contains other stuff, but we have access to this. And just the same way that we have access to understanding, we have access to faith. We can, we're humans happen to have that. And every artist is unconcerned with that. They're like, yeah, I don't like, I can't think through and analytically describe the rational purpose behind why I actually went up and created this particular tone or art or, but it's obviously true. But it's, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't like, I was just random. Like there was something going on that my faculty of artistry gave me the ability to distinguish between right and wrong and you know, more or less beautiful. Right? That's a, that's a thing. It's not random. It's not capricious. Right? It's, it's actually no less random and capricious than truth is. And it's a deeper substrate that includes a much larger portion of reality with which we can come into relationship. Right? So, and it governs it. Again, every time that I believe that I've identified something as true, I've said, oh, yes, that's a cup. That's one plus one equals two. I notice if I take the time that the, the faculty of beauty is actually happening first. And then the faculty of understanding is sitting on top of that and doing stuff with that. Right? It's, it's naming it. It's articulating it. It's clothing it in a variety of different forms that allow me to do the things with it. Right? I can now rotate that back out feed it back into this faculty and come back up with other stuff. I can do math, um, but I'm doing math by means of this larger complex. And so that's the point, right? Once you get to that, then you can say, okay, well, what does it look like for me to begin to orient, intentionally orient and cultivate here? How do I get a deeper, stronger faith? How do I broaden that faith and begin to notice what aspects of faith are currently outside of the vertical of my limited understanding and begin to actually begin to make choices from beyond my understanding? from a deeper place than my own understanding, but not, again, arbitrary, capricious, or illusory, but actually in some sense, even more fundamental, not in some sense, in, in, a, in a very profound sense, more fundamental. Um, and of course, this is very, very helpful because then it allows us to even ground hope. And right? this, this is it. So I think that, that another part of the story, and I have to not be an advocate on, on the part of those who I was accusing, um, this has been a war going on. There's been a real serious conflict for resources, right? for just straight up forward power and money and status and probably mating opportunities and fancy cars and whatnot, all the sort of pitiful stuff that motivates humans. Um, and that war has been going on for quite a while. And it was a guerrilla warfare on the on the part of the, the science types for a pretty good amount of time. Right? So they had to learn how to fight dirty, as all guerrilla warfares do. And in that process of fighting dirty, oh my gosh, we see this happening all over our culture right now. So many things that are happening in our culture at the sort of the ideo political level are merely the consequence of guerrilla warfare happening at the cultural level in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, winning and still fighting guerrilla warfare style. Um, same thing happened with science. So science is sort of continuing to fight a, a uh, guerrilla warfare in a world where it's actually established imperial dominion. Um, and is now beginning to have this process of, um, uh, as all empires do, noticing that it actually can't maintain itself in the context of the things that it's destroying or the things that it, are actually its underpinnings, the ne necessity that it has to have. Um, that started to go a little bit off the rail, but I think there was some, something useful in there. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about your structure. <clears throat> I know you probably... I do, yeah. Time. You have what? Oh, five fine. minutes? About five, maybe 10 minutes. Okay. So your structure with communication at the top and then love at the bottom. So we go communication, understanding, hope, faith, I mean, faith, hope, love. So um, I think that's also a beautiful picture of the way that uh, when Jonathan Peugeot talks about hierarchy, excuse me, I just... It's a little cold in here. I got a shiver. <laughs> so um, with, if you think about communication being the word, with the word at the top, and uh, at the top of any hierarchy is the one who comes down the hierarchy and brings everybody back up again. And so with the word at the top and love at the bottom, you get this picture of this constant circulation of the 
the top mm. simultaneously incorporating, including the bottom and bringing it back up again. So it's bringing it back up through love and hope and faith to understanding and then then communication. So so that's one picture that I get of that uh, churn that's sort of in there. Another picture I get is when you were talking about hope, it felt like uh, when you were talking about hope and faith and then on the other side, understanding, it felt almost like you were talking about the two hemispheres of the brain with the, with the right hemisphere being the one that has more of an access to this, uh, the embodied capacities relating to <clears throat> the reality that's out there and then handing that off to the understanding to the left hemisphere and then the left hemisphere kind of gets all up in itself <laughs> and of course McGilchrist says that the problem isn't between those two the problem is that the understanding doesn't come back and reunite with with the uh with the right hemisphere mm -hmm. yeah that would be sin yeah well what I picture between my picture of the right and left hemisphere isn't of a master and the emissary, but of a marriage of a wife and a husband and the union that needs to take place so that what comes in the union is more than either one can be on its own. And uh, that, so when, when the, when the husband takes all the wife's love and adoration and doesn't return that with, with care and support and nurture, then, then you've got something that's very out of balance. Right. And uh, I think that picture of marriage actually goes, drills all the way down to the base of the universe as well. Mm -hmm. That even zero and one are married. <laughs> I, I guess that gets to you're you're more of a computer guy than I am, but I, I've been reading quite a bit about fuzzy logic lately, and the idea that that there is this um, there's an infinity between zero and one, and we need to understand that so that we're not just thinking that everything is either zero or one. Mm -hmm. And I think about that a lot because with these principles of art, when I make a stroke, and that stroke is maybe not my intention, but there's some intention from somewhere that that stroke is contributing to the harmony of the painting or is contributing to the, the balance of the painting. That it's contributing in some way that is not all balance or no balance. It's somewhere in between there where it's a perfect proportion of balance for that context. It's a perfect proportion of gradation for that context, a perfect proportion of color for that context so each stroke is containing the proper proportion of all these different binaries in that one moment of time at that place and um mm. that is the marriage of all these fuzziness between zero and one at each point in time and it's i i can't it's one of those things that's so big i lose it if I try to describe it in words, but as long as I don't describe it in words, it's a complete picture in my brain. <laughs> yeah, nice. Well, that's, that's a, to, an example of this notion of where there's actually a limit of understanding. And yes. It's not necessarily a limit of your understanding. It's a limit of understanding, qua understanding. Yes. You know, and try to truly grasp the whole of that with understanding would find themselves either getting lost or reducing it down to a lower level projection that captured some of it, but could be said. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But this is very much, by the way, the one and zero problem. So the one and zero problem, if we think about it properly, what happens is, is you say, I've got the one, I've got the zero, and I've got the relationship between them. Mm -hmm. And if I recognize that neither one nor zero is in fact actually real. They both represent polarities. The relationship between them is, is what's actually real. Yeah. And it's it's undifferentiated. I mean, I can, I can if at any point I can select a location in the relationship between them and I can choose to cut a line there. And now I, what I can do is I can identify that. I can give that a, a name or a point, but it's not like I'm toggling uh, in the, in, in like, sorry, let me say that a little bit more clearly. Sometimes what we might do is we might do the classic, okay, well, 0 0.1, 0 0.11. I can do the one and zero and I can just replicate that at a lower level of granularity. Like just keep going down. I call this the Leibnizian error. Right. Leibniz 
invoked this post this notion of hey i can i can just keep getting infinitesimal and get smaller and smaller gradations of the zero and one problem but of course what happens is, is when i zoom in a, at any point of gradation still got the old-fashioned zero and one problem the relationship between them has continuity right there there is no point at which you zoom in and you see a zero and one it actually is whole all the way through and then when i slice it when i take a point I'm doing a sample of it and I'm reducing it to that. Right? So that's that's an important thing. That's part of what the left brain does. I want to go back there to a kind of a homuncular model that I think McGilchrist agrees with this, but I'm not sure it's it's clear. Um, but it's not so much that the left brain and the right brain are sort of symmetric and in some sense opposed or even in partnership, but rather that the right hemisphere by its nature is connected with the whole of embodiment which by its nature is connected in a well-integrated way with the whole of the context, which by its way is intrinsically and non-removably connected with the whole of cosmos. Right? It may be small amounts, maybe large amounts, but of course things like complexity theory and chaos theory tell us that a small amount somewhere may in fact be a large amount somewhere else. So it's very difficult to know that a small amount of implication in cosmos isn't actually relevant to right now. And some part of me is attuned to be sensitive to that wholeness right, of which the right hemisphere takes responsibility for that in the context of neurology so it's my like the way i've always seen is i have like the left hemisphere and then i have the entire cosmos in gradations of grayness into darkness so i've got this white thing here and then dark here but this dark gradiates out to lightness to infinity um mm -hmm. and i think is the proper model of what we're talking about so and, and, and of course from that point of view then you, your, your notion of marriage and by the way your notion of that pyramid of love and word so let's use that one what i was noticing is like huh so can I, can I say something like it's like spirit is what guides us from here, like attunement to spirit at the level of love and hope. Right? It's very difficult to articulate. We couldn't give it words yet, but we can definitely feel it qualitatively. And we can listen to that, which is um, typically never embodied, right? We don't have images of what the spirit looks like. We have metaphors of the spirit descends like a dove, but it's always like a dove, not a dove. But in any event, it rises up, right? And it, and it, and it brings us up. And then, as you said, the word descends down. And so these, this, the thing that's happening here is the relationship between the son and the spirit and their mutual relationality, which is quite, from my point of view, seems quite, quite beautiful in the context of, say, the, the body of the church. Right? So if mm -hmm. we are situated as part of the body of the church or, or the body of Christ, mm -hmm. Christ as the head is coming down. The spirit as an indwelling within us is what is bringing us into an integrated wholeness. Right? The spirit, remember, wow. Nice. Remember the spirit of the music, like that feeling of while, where the, the song all came together. And it's like, oh, that's the spirit of the song or well, the spirit of God, right? As it is indwelling within us, as we become capable of perceiving and living from our faculties of hope and faith in that, we are becoming, we're noticing we're part of that song. We're part of that well-orchestrated music. And as we notice more and more of our parts coming together, like, oh, we are actually part of an, an a, a well integrated wholeness known as the spirit, which is itself part of a well a well integrated wholeness known as the Trinity, um, and so that brings us up into relationship with the Son, and in that in that coming in together and that in, in infinitely and infinitesimally intimate relationship between the Spirit and the Son, and us that indwelling of the Spirit bringing us into that capacity, the Son coming down and providing that same like the the dance right all the 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 set of constraints and the set of allurements and the set of that uh, the glimmer that draws us forth and ultimately then of course to the Father then unfolds folds us back into the Trinity. Ha! Huh, that's fun. He is wooing us from the jaws of restriction to a place of abundance, laden with choice food. <laughs> choice food. <laughs> juicy, juicy choice food. Well, I I just I've always loved that the fact that he is wooing us that it oh, is yeah. a cosmic romance right, and that that we are trapped in the jaws of restriction, but he has laid out for us a place of abundance. So if we can just let down the walls, and let it happen, this has been amazing, Jordan. Thank you so much. I I as you were talking about the dance and the music, it made me think immediately of Richard Watson and his new theory that. That um, and he's a he's a, a materialist scientist with some openness to this idea of love being the foundation of the universe. Oh, um, his idea is that music that um, music that life is actually a song, and he's worked it all out scientifically. 
<laughs> um, and I think that he would love having a conversation with you because he's really open to trying to understand this more because um, as it's one of those big pictures, you know. Well, I think there the, the right way of saying it is that we would be playing music together. We would happen to be using our voices and we would sound like words for a while. Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much. And uh, I hope we can do this again sometime. Well, you know, it seems to me like you're tracking something in a very profound way. And I was noticing feeling first honored and then humbled that you invited me to be part of this. So um, I'm, it seems like you felt like it was worth your time. And I'm glad of that. And I hope that it and I hope that it actually also was. Um, well, so, it, because I could see what I see happening is I see a number of people coming to the same place. It's like all these different pictures are coming. And at some point, it's going to be like Jordan Peterson <laughs> symphony stacking up, you know. Yeah. That's because right. My, my picture has been on the way for more than 30 years, maybe for, close to 40 years. That picture has been building. But once, once I got into the creativity realm about 20 years ago, it became much clearer to me because I could see this whole picture of the principles, right? Yeah, your picture has come through this whole trajectory of all the the businesses, entrepreneurship, ideas, and then this uh, meta crisis place, and and it, you're so. You, and when you described when you described the development of the zygote, and I could kind of see this whole picture that you had and how it was fitting with my picture, then I hear like someone like Richard Watson talking about life as a song, even though he's looking at it strictly materially from a from a physics standpoint that doesn't really scare me because i mean physics is a thing <laughs> you know it scales all the way through so um i just see all these pictures coming together and and then it, it all happens that it's happening at the same time in history with someone like Ian McGilchrist now becoming known with this big picture idea and someone like Jordan Peterson with this big picture idea and someone like Bishop Barron, who's able to take all of this stuff and look at it through a lens of, you know, the, the church fathers and someone like the fact that we're all living at the same time in history is pretty yeah. remarkable. And it's not as though we all started thinking about this just because of listening to each other we've been coming at this for a long time. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I think it's very few of us were listening to each other. If I, if I turn the clock back 15 years ago, I don't think I'd heard of any of the people that you've mentioned, like zero of them. Maybe Jordan Peterson in 1995, but that was like T zero. Well, and honestly, I wasn't listening to you because that whole... Um, that whole thing over there in the what was that called with the triangle the <laughs> all you guys that were talking to each other over there in that corner of the of the internet four or five years ago i can't remember what it was even called no anyway, i wasn't listening to that because that that whole meta crisis thing the way it was getting talked about it seemed kind of like it was a fear thing mm. my mantra is always that perfect love drives out fear <clears throat> So I don't want to go to the fear places and listen to that too much because it it creates too much of a conflict in my mind when I'm thinking mm. about other things. So nice, yeah, I get that. That's a good, that's a good rule. I, I was I never engaged with it as a fear thing, but that's because I am naturally wired that way. But I can totally get how if you weren't naturally wired that way, it would probably would produce a significant fear response. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, okay, so this is a handshake. Like the the net the network graph just had a. a <laughs> Something good happened. Have a great week. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.